All right, to close out this little part with chapter one, I wanted to hit on two final concepts. One of them is gonna be nationalism, and then the other one over here is gonna be sovereignty, which is gonna tie in with your first paper. I'm sure you've heard of nationalism before, and nationalism really has three basic components. And to give you an idea, this is broken down on page 21 of the chapter. Basically, when you're dealing with nationalism, there are three things that have gotta be present. One is that citizens have got to have a connection somehow with their government and with each other. So for example, maybe it would be a, an extremely popular political leader. This rallying behind a particular leader to support that leader would be a good example of the beginnings of nationalism. Maybe it would be a particular culture. Maybe it would be a particular culture. So when you think about uh, Israel, Israel has certainly rallied around itself and it's rallied around its history in order the thought would be to defend itself over the years since it's become a country. It could also be very, very religious in nature. Whether you're talking about fundamentalist conservative Christians or maybe whether you're talking about the Middle East and you're talking about Islam. Bottom line is, is that people oftentimes will be joined together. They'll have a connection with each other based upon their particular religion. You've got to have a connection of some sort, whether it's political, whether it's social or cultural, and definitely religion would be one of these. Number two, the government has got to have legitimacy. And what I mean when I say legitimacy, the government must have legitimacy from the people. So for example, this actually means that popular sovereignty, that idea that the people are choosing the leaders, are going to be a big part of nationalism. You've got to have a connection somehow that binds people together, and you've got to have that legitimacy that they support their government, that they chose their government, that indeed their government reflects what it is that they want. Here in the United States, we have nationalism in the sense of, when you think about it, uh, waving the American flag would be a good example because the flag represents a lot of values within the United States. We have popular sovereignty here so that there is legitimacy. The political figures are chosen by the people, so you've got these two points basically covered. The third one up here is the idea of national self-determination. National self-determination, and what I mean by this is your country has what is known as self-rule. When you think about the United States today, there is nobody in the world that will tell the United States what to do. So when you think about it, we have a connection based upon our freedom. We have a connection based upon our values with each other and other Americans. The idea that we have popular sovereignty or we, the government gets legitimacy from the people, absolutely that's there. And then as far as self-rule or national self-determination, there is no one in the world that can tell us what to do right now. So the thought is, is that we cover all through three of those bases very, very well. When you look at Iraq today, Iraq right now, they have absolutely got a connection. They have got several connections in there that seem to fight against each other because of different strands of religion, you might say. Now, having said this, those each strand is very, very strong, but they're strong almost against each other. When you put this in the context of legitimacy, Iraq today is having elections. They've had elections for a number of years now. They've chosen their leaders, but their leaders aren't exactly able to do a whole lot at this point. So just because the people pick them, it doesn't mean that it's effective over there. And lastly, self-rule. There would be a good argument out there that some folks would say that it's really the United States that is doing a lot of the ruling over in Iraq today. It's almost like they're the 51st state when they really want to just be their own country. So Iraq has got a lot of things going on over there. Nationalism is a complicated part of it, but they're failing a number of these tests that you wouldn't see being failed in the United States. The last thing for today is actually going to be the term sovereignty. Sovereignty is going to be the term, and this actually comes from page 16 of the chapter. The idea behind sovereignty very simply is this is the right of individual states to determine their policies, to determine their goals, to determine the direction of their country. Now, what you'll find is in chapter one, I've given you a sovereignty paper assignment. And I've given you about five or six articles where I'm gonna ask you to define, first of all, what sovereignty is. And then I want you to think about some of the different things that other countries are doing. And I want you to, to, to basically defend to me or attack for me, if you will, whether or not that those kinds of things should be allowed. I mean, we're talking about slavery that's still existing around the world. 
We're talking in these articles about the idea that there are child brides that are basically being set up when they're less than 10 year olds with husbands that are two or three or four times their age, something that would be clearly illegal in the United States. We're talking about things like gender selective abortions, where females are being aborted in a number of countries with high populations, specifically because they're female, because boy children would be more valuable to the family. Again, these policies you can debate on either side. The idea behind sovereignty, though, is as a sovereign country, you determine what it is. You determine what the policies are, what it is that goes on within your borders. And as a sovereign country, no other country is supposed to be able to come in and take that away. So if the United States doesn't like gender-selective abortions, which seems like it would discriminate against women, a sovereign country has the right to do that. A country that is not sovereign or not independent would not have that right. And some people would say it's the prerogative of the United States to go over there and try and change things like this. And some folks would say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We need to focus on our own problems within our own borders before we start going around and trying to change the world. For this first paper, what I want you to do is I want you to take a look at three of those articles. I want you to use the text, to use this little bit of YouTube, and maybe even a couple of private sources on this, your own sources. And I want you, in a really good paragraph, to offer me a strong definition of what sovereignty means. And then I want you to take three of those articles, and I want you to explain to me what's going on in these articles, and then I want you to explain to me if this type of policy, whether it's dealing with slavery, or child brides. Maybe it's dealing with the prison system in the United States because I believe you've got one of those whether these types of things should be allowed. Because remember, if the United States opens a door to violate another country's sovereignty, then ultimately that means that other countries can open that door and could potentially violate ours. I will stop here at this point with chapter one. If y'all have questions, please give me a holler. If not, get started on the paper. Good luck with the readings and the quizzes, and we'll go from there. Thank you.